Would you please pray with me? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the reading is long today because we have been reading all through the book of Luke, starting back at the beginning of December. And so we have gotten to a very intense part of the book here about demons. So let me start with a story. As part of the seminary curriculum, for those in seminary, at least when I was in seminary, um, our third year of school was actually a whole year spent on internship. So you do class for your first year, classroom for your second year, then the third year was no class, full immersion, full-time ministry at a church where you were the intern. And I had a supervisor that um, watched over me and gave me orders and just one of the most amazing pastor people I've ever met in my life. One night on that internship year, we were having some sort of event at the church and um, a call came to the church. I'm not sure who even got it, but the story from the phone call was that there was a woman that lived across the street um, on the homebound women. And I'll, I'll say her name was Mary for the sake of the story. Her name was Mary. And Mary was struggling with her faith. And so she asked if someone could come over and just talk with her. And so Pastor Steve made me do it. I, th- I think I'm going to turn off the mic. Or Joe, can we turn it down maybe? And I'll just try and project better. Is that okay? No one's nodding. Is the, would you rather have the feedback or me talking louder? Well, Eric, you're right in front. That doesn't count for you. <laughs> so I went, um, I drew the short straw apparently according to Pastor Steve, and I went across the street to talk to Mary who was having some sort of spiritual crisis. Um, and I walked into her house, and her daughter was there, and I said, you know, what's going on here, Mary? You know, I'd visit her maybe once or twice already, and she said, um, I, don't, I don't think there's a God. I just, I don't believe, I can't experience God anymore. I don't believe in God anymore. And I thought to myself, crap, they didn't teach me this in seminary on what to say to this situation, and Pastor Steve didn't tell me what I was supposed to do in this moment. So I sat there, and I did what they do teach you, which is to ask questions. You and you Bible study can relate to that, right? Ask questions. So I said, say more about this. She's like, there's nothing more to say. I just don't believe in God anymore. I don't experience God, and so I don't feel God. And I said, okay. And then it, I, I, I had sort of an idea. And so I read from Romans 8, like the end of the chapter, where it says, You know, there's all these things that can happen to us in life. There can be floods and turmoil and famines and life and death and all all these things. And then Paul says at the very end, and none of that separates us from from, um, Christ's love to us, that God's love to us, that nothing separates us from God's love. And so I said to her, I said, no matter how you feel, no matter how well you sense God, God does not abandon you, and God loves you. It's not about your trust, your knowledge, your feeling inside. And you know what she said? Okay. And then I sulked and went back over to the church, feeling like I hadn't fixed anything. I didn't realize it at the time, and I didn't have the life experiences to put that moment into um, a larger perspective. Um, But what she was really dealing with, I think, was some sort of mental health struggle. And so I want to talk this morning a little bit about demons and mental health. And so I'm going to go to a story of mine after my story with Mary there to help me put that experience and this reading into a different light. It was almost five years ago, I started finding myself panicking and like having um, heart palpitations and um, having anxiety about the world we live in. Um, So I thought that if I could just make it to the summer um, and go on vacation, I would feel all better. And so we got to the summer and at the end of the summer, we all went to, to the Outer Banks. We did a big family vacation with our family. And I expected that time away from ministry would be like the thing that would get me all back in order. Um, On the way home, I almost had to pull over because I had such a bad panic, anxiety sort of attack. I didn't have the words for it then, but my chest was super tight, I was sweating, and I was convinced that the world was going to end because Ebola was going to break out here in Aliquippa, and my family was going to get it, they were all going to die, and then it was going to spread throughout the whole world, and we were all going to die. It sounds stupid, doesn't it? I mean, let's be honest, that is an unrealistic thing to think or to believe, or that it even have that sort of repercussions for me. And so I knew I was, um, I wouldn't say in trouble, but I was struggling badly. And so I reached out to our bishop, who was incredibly receptive. He made space for me the next morning, and he told me a couple of things that were important. 
One, um, those things were not real. That sort of anxiety was not real or normal, um, and that there are things I could do to start helping myself out. One of which was um, to start giving myself to a regular prayer life. The other was to go to counseling. And so I went to counseling. If you've never been, or if you have a negative opinion of counseling, too bad for you. It was a great experience for me. It was a chance for me to tell my story, to reflect on what had gotten me to that point. The anxiety wasn't the, really, the real thing. I knew that there really wasn't an Ebola thing that was going to kill us all, but the anxiety was real, and the, re- and the, the cause of those things were real, and my own struggles were real. There were real moments when I felt like I could not find hope in life. There were real moments where I wasn't not faithful, but I just couldn't live into any sort of healthy living, where I thought everything was negative, and I was completely taken by the evil, by the darkness, I kept calling it. When I read stories like this about a man possessed by demons, that is what I think. The word demon is a hard one for me to relate to. I never called my struggles demonic. Um, I have a hard time personifying evil like calling it Satan or the devil. But in those moments, those waves of anxiety, of depression, of angst, of my chest being super tight and being overwhelmed with those things, um, I can see why someone 2,000 years ago, without the modern day language and understanding of neurotransmitters firing the right way and um, a whole field of psychology, would have called it demonic, and why a person um, who it seems like had many different voices inside them would call them demons. I mean, nowadays we'd call something like this, maybe multiple personalities disorder, or maybe schizophrenia or something like that, but for my experience, I can look back and see this story and call it mental illness, and I think that that is something that a lot of us can relate to in the world we live in now. Um, So the statistics are that here in America, one in five adults will struggle with some sort of mental illness, um, like diagnosable mental illness struggle this year. So I dare to say a lot of us in this room will struggle in these ways. It isn't somewhere else, someone else, something else. It's, if it's not you, it's the person beside you, or in front of you, or behind you. And we have a way of always making mental illness out to be this big, scary, terrible, awful thing, sort of like they did here in the first century, right? They've made this guy be possessed by a demon. Um, He's, people were scared. Did you see how they said that multiple times? But yet this reality pops up multiple times in Luke. In the fourth chapter, right off the bat, Jesus encounters someone that is struggling with a demon. Over and over again, people come to Jesus with demons. I believe, friends, that people have been struggling with mental illness for a long time. We just have better ways of talking about it and caring for it now. If that is your situation, first of all today, know that you are not alone. You are not the only one that struggles from mental illness. And you're not only dealing with mental illness now. The world isn't worse now than what it always has been. If we look at these stories as stories of people struggling with mental illness, you are in good company, friends, because people for thousands of years have been dealing with mental illness. And I see Jesus in this story of mental illness doing two things. I see God at work in two ways. The first way is so beautifully obvious. It is not God's vision for us to struggle with mental illness. It isn't. When Jesus shows up on the scene, he cures people of their mental illness. He fixes it. He makes it go away. God doesn't want us to struggle with mental illness. If you struggle with anxiety or depression or other forms of mental illness, there is hope for you that God does not want that to be your situation. And God loves you in the middle of that situation. The second thing that's, that's powerful about this story is that it is cured. There's process. Now, we don't have Jesus here in 2019 to do whatever Jesus did in the first century to make demons simply escape and, and go into pigs and jump into water and drown themselves. But we do live in a world where there are, there are things you can do if you struggle for mental illness. I don't know if you've noticed, but across the street, um, for quite a while now, there's been a car that sits there and it has a sticker on the back window. And the sticker says, to write love on her arms. Have you seen that sticker across the, the way? Maybe you've seen it in other places in the world. Have you seen that? So that, 
that slogan to write love on her arms um, is part of a nonprofit movement of making awareness for mental illness, especially mental illness that might drive people to, write, uh, to cut or hurt themselves. And so the movement began with a young woman that was, wrote a really terrible thing about herself on her arm. And the people she was living with saw this awfulness on her arm. Um, and out of their Christian love for her, it's a Christian movement, they gathered around her and flooded her with love and compassion, trying to change that narrative in her head to one of value and care and love for her. If you struggle, friends, there are systems and there are people and there are places out there to talk to. There are phone numbers to call. There are people in your life that you can reach out to. God has put those systems in place for you to find love and care. Some of those people are here sitting beside you. If you are one of those one in five, look to the people sitting beside you, in front of you, and behind you. We aren't mental, kel- mental, hair, kel- mental health care professionals, but we can listen to stories and we can tell you that God loves you. But there are people out there that are professionals that you can go to. And it is my belief, deep inside of me, that God has, has put those kind of people out there, counselors and pastors and, and professionals that can help you in your mental struggles and care for you. Remember, friends, you are loved. No matter what you are struggling with, no matter what demons you are fighting, what evilness you are with right now, or what waves are pulling you down, what darkness you are in, you are so loved. Whether you are like Mary and cannot grab onto that, cannot hold that for yourself, know that it is true. You are loved. Amen.